This episode is sponsored by JMR Rentals, professional digital cinema and broadcast rentals in Brooklyn, New York. To find out more, visit their website, jmrny.com. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and joining me via Zoom today, he is the director of the documentary The Right Girls, all the way from Baltimore, Maryland, Mr. Timothy Wolfer. Welcome, Timothy. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for coming. Where are you, uh, where are you based anyway? I'm based here in Baltimore. Uh, I've lived here for about five years or so, and uh, it's kind of a great place to be a filmmaker. It's close to New York, close to D.C., uh, but it also has a vibrant arts community. All right, so the film is called The Right Girls, and I want to talk about that, definitely. We reviewed it on the show. Bill Hammond did a great review of it, liked it a lot. And uh, I also, but I want to talk to you, before we get into the movie, I want to talk to you about you and kind of find out how you got into filmmaking. So what is your origin story, so to speak? I started working for a PBS station when I was in high school, just kind of as a something to do after school. I had emailed them and I was kind of curious about the, the film industry and they had offered me an internship that eventually turned into a job. Uh, at the time, nonlinear editing was uh, becoming all the rage. And so I had taught myself uh, Final Cut 4 or yeah, Final Cut 4 back then, and uh, so I ended up working at PBS for a long time um, and kind of fell in love with documentaries there. Ended up going out to film school, and then after, uh, after that, ended up starting a small production company. And for the last 10 years or so, I've been working for like humanitarian aid agencies uh, and nonprofits putting together their like, um, corporate documentaries you could say, or um, an advocacy for, for the missions that they, they serve. So The Right Girls, uh, tell us about the film. Like, give me like the log line, like the Hollywood log line for the, the film and kind of talk about how it sort of came to be. So it's the story of four transgender women who uh, band together during the uh, migrant caravan that was coming across Mexico in 2018. And their whole, uh, their whole mission was to make it to the U.S. and uh, request asylum and set up a better future for themselves. The film came to be when I was reading a lot of the news and, and the rhetoric about, specifically coming from Trump, about like how these people were criminals and just saying these horrible inflammatory things. And I knew a lot of that uh, was not true from my experience working with migrants and uh, in the aid sector for the last 10 years. So... I uh, simply just jumped on a plane one, one afternoon and flew down to southern Mexico and found the caravan. And within the first 24 hours, I found these girls on the side of the road or these women on the side of the road and uh, asked if I could follow them. And they said, uh, sure. So the next morning I followed them. And then the next morning I followed them again. And about six weeks later, we have the film you see today. So did you have any kind of a crew for this movie? Or is it just I by... You did this all by yourself? Uh, I mean, yeah, the, the production was mostly by myself. I, uh, wow. uh, I just had a backpack with a couple of changes of clothes and, and, uh, my DSLR with a really good audio setup. And, uh, it was all handheld uh, with the exception of a few master interviews. Once I got to Tijuana. You, what did you film this thing on? You must have had like a pretty running gun compact setup. Yeah. I have an a 6,500 with the Sony alpha camera. Um, and then I have a, uh, it's a uh, $900 camera with a $1,000 microphone on the top. So I've got a MKH416 on the top, and that's how you get the, the good quality audio. And so you were just kind of walking with these people and shooting and kind of asking them questions and, and following them as they went along? Yeah, exactly. I, would just, uh, I just had a series of the same questions. I would just ask them every day you know, how, uh, how they were feeling, what they were up to for the day, where we were going next. Uh, and just kind of like would run through it. And after a while, they, they would just uh, talk to the camera and it really became their own story of them uh, narrating the film. How long were you there? Like how long were you sort of uh, with these people? 
Uh, about six weeks. It was about a week or a little over a week to get from uh, southern Mexico to, to Mexico City. And then uh, another few days to get up to Tijuana because they took buses. Uh, and then a few more weeks of uh, waiting around until the, to the end of the film. And I don't want to give it away. But yeah. So where, where did you actually meet them? Where, where geographically were you when, the, when you guys met up? It was, uh, it was in a small town in, in the, one of the southern states of Mexico. And they were, it was actually a Saturday. It was their day off. The, the caravan was tired. And so they had decided to stop moving for a day and just kind of recuperate, like underneath of a canopy on somebody's store, like out in front of the store. And uh, they were just hanging out there. And uh, I, I was very attracted to them because in a situation like that, things are very uh, desperate. It's a very horrible thing situation that was happening but they were dancing and having fun to some music and I was just intrigued by by these women that they were kind of making the most of this uh of this situation and just curious who they were and, and just wanted to get to know them better so you had no idea if you were going to find anyone I mean you knew that roughly where this thing was right because you had sort of seen it on the news did you, you, you had no fixer, you had no inside information about how things were going. You like, and you I, didn't, you didn't yeah, know who you were going to talk to. Yeah. I actually found the caravan by following the Washington Post website because they were putting out a map. And so that's how I was able to catch up with them. But yeah, I'm very uncomfortable with the unknown. I think that uh, filmmaking, a lot of times we try and control the situation too much or plan it. Uh, whereas a story like this, I mean, it's very much journalism and you just, you go and say, I'm going to find a story and, and follow it and it may work out and it may not. Uh, but just being very comfortable with that, uh, with that space and just letting it play out in front of you and, and just open to the circumstances. And like, how did you sleep and get food and like, how, how were you? Did you go down there with like, did you have like a bus or were, how how were you um, kind of keeping yourself healthy and all that kind of stuff? A lot of the uh, journalists that were working on the caravan, we would team up and so we would split rides and stuff. Uh, and then there are hotels throughout Mexico. So I would usually try and find a hotel at night or um, sometimes there there would be other places that we could camp out, you know, in the where the caravan was or the girls were or the women were. So. So you discover these people, these are complete strangers to you, and then they, they, you finally start talking to them. And now you've got a rapport, and now you start filming them. When did you know that you had a story to tell? That, you know, like this was, when did you know, like, you know, like in Hollywood, they have that expression, it's a movie, you know, like, totally. w w when were you like, it's a movie, like, this is not a video, this is not just a post or Instagram, you know, like, when did you know this is a documentary? That's a good question. I I don't think I knew until I really got into the post-production, maybe even. It was very much, it was very much, uh, I was just kind of curious to see what would happen next. So just continuing with it. Uh, once I got to Mexico City and, and they were able to organize with several uh, nonprofits to, to, to make it up to Tijuana, I definitely knew by then that it was a very unique story that was uh, one of a kind. But um, once we got into post and saw what we had, that's when we really knew it was going to be a, a feature length documentary and not just a shorter news clip. So you were basically uh, running and gunning by yourself for the most part. Uh, mm -hmm. at, at the end of it, did you wind up getting footage from other people? And like, how did, like, so you, you come back, how long, so you're on the road for six weeks, you said? Correct. And so you come back after six weeks and then you got a ton of footage, I imagine. Uh, and then how did that begin? How did you like go th get, how did you make it through all that footage? And did you have a team, uh, helping you with posts and all that kind of stuff? The post-production is, is, uh, one of the interesting parts to the film. I did have a team. I had like, um, several friends who, who helped translate the film. And then I had a friend that was a, like an assistant editor who, who helped set up the project and everything like that. One of the biggest issues with this film was the translations. And so to do that, what we, what we did is we uh, hired a team of, of people in uh, Venezuela who actually transcribed the entire film into Spanish uh, 
and then we sunk it all with SRT files and then used Microsoft uh, Translate to translate everything into English so that we could actually read what they were saying. So all 40 hours of footage or so that we had selected. No, I guess we whittled it down to like 17 hours or so that we had translated. So cut it into sections and then they laid it over and then we cut it with all these SRTs lined up and then that's the film you saw and then we went through and professionally translated it all. Do you speak Spanish? Uh, uh, no, not very well. So how were you able to communicate with the subjects? Because I assume all, they're all speaking Spanish. Yeah, I, I, uh, I learned or I use Google Translate a lot. And then, and like I said, I just had the same questions and they learned after a while to just kind of answer them each day for me. Were you able to kind of understand them and communicate? And did they feel like they were being understood or did they feel like they were just talking at somebody's camera kind of thing? Did they, did you have like, because, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about with documentary a lot is sort of the observer effect and like, would this movie happen? And it's in this movie, Bill and I were talking about uh, the subjects and how uh, like maybe one of the, the subjects would like sort of play to the camera and be a little bit more open and, and so forth. And did you find that you were affecting the story just by being there? And like, were you trying to avoid that? What was that kind of rapport and communication like? I was definitely trying not to affect the story, but I think um, I think in journalism, anytime a, a journalist is there, you are affecting the story in some way. So uh, to say that I wasn't affecting it just definitely is not accurate, but I was trying to, to be an observer as much as possible and, and not interfere and, and, uh, and let them, let them uh, go along their way. And I, I assume that, you know, cause I've talked to, I've interviewed quite a few documentary film uh, makers since the show started. And, you know, one thing that happens when you're there with a long time is you kind of develop this rapport with the people there. Uh, did you guys stay in touch or are they like, are, are they planning a mini series with you after this? Like, how is, uh, uh, are you still involved in any way? I, I'm still very, uh, I'm very uh, in touch with them very closely. Uh, and they're all doing well, as well as can be uh, expected. So that's, that is what it is. But yeah, we are, we're very much still in touch. I think the thing that uh, most people have their hard time wrapping their head around is that you basically just jumped in a car and went down south to see what you were going to get kind of thing. I mean, did you, you were there for six weeks. I mean, did you have the proviso? Could you just like blow off work for a month and a half and like, how did you get any funding for this? Like, how how were you like able to do all that? You know, I was very lucky that it was a slow period. I, I worked for myself at a small production company, uh, and it was just a slow time. And I had several people that were helping me out and kind of taking care of things back here that I was able to blow off the six weeks and and uh, stick with it. But yeah, it it was not planned. It was very much a spontaneous thing. Uh, I was just I really wanted to show the human side of the caravan and and uh, that migrants are people that are just looking for a better future uh, and, and just try and humanize that as much as possible. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we talked about, I mean, and of course, you know, this was such a sociopolitical hot button and, you know, a big story uh, that we heard, especially with the election year and all that kind of stuff. And I, I feel like, I mean, there's been so, I feel like there's so many things that have happened since then, uh, but the story's still relevant. Uh, and, you know, you getting involved, did you ever feel like uh, this was like, did you ever feel like an outsider or felt like you were, because uh, I don't know what kind of team of journalists you were with, but, you know, were they mainly local people or is this all people from, in other words, like, I'm trying to be nice about it, but was it just a bunch of white guys following this whole caravan and, and was there a breakdown or, or a, a sort of a barrier there that you had to get through? The caravan was about 7,000 people, and there was a huge number of international journalists there following it. I would say maybe 100 or so from, from all over the world that were, were sticking with the caravan. Uh, and along that, you have different like levels of engagement. You have people that are just pointing at their camera and saying whatever they're seeing, uh, 
which is a form of journalism. And then you had people that were getting more involved. And then, you know, I built a rapport with these, uh, with these women and, and they were gracious enough to, to be very open and honest with me. And so I didn't feel like an outsider necessarily. Uh, I felt like they were comfortable with me and I was comfortable with them and I just stuck with it. What do you see um, coming out of this next or, or what are the plans for the documentary at this point? So the plans are, uh, we, we've got a distribution deal and, and through VOD, and you can learn more about that, obviously, on our website. But uh, I, we really want to push it to different uh, organizations that are working around issues of migration uh, and LGBTI uh, communities and let them use the film to, to um, really show the plight of, of migrants and, and transgender women living in the United States. I mean, that, that's certainly part of the part of the conversation that's happening now in terms of, I mean, immigration has been a hot button topic uh, roughly since 2016. Uh, certainly uh, trans rights, uh, certainly the rights of minorities. Uh, you, you know, I've never been myself wanting ever wanted to get involved with anything political in my filmmaking or even on this show. Like we don't it's not a political show. We kind of acknowledge that things happen but it, it's not a soapbox and, you know, we generally don't get involved in it. But I think these types of documentaries are important because I feel like, and I, I've said this before, but I, I feel like this is kind of where real news is coming from. I, I feel like a lot of news is kind of news utainment now and everything's like quick sound bites and you wouldn't get like a real picture from most media, you know, or most American media, maybe. I, do yeah. you agree with that or? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the beauty of the documentary is it, it is a form of journalism, but it can break past that sound bite and uh, like it'll break past that information and just kind of show the human side of it. And uh, I think that that's, that's the best form of, of opening up a discussion is allowing people to see, okay, here's the situation. Uh, and, and it's tail each person's situation is different. And like, we have to have discussions that's inclusive and, and really brings light to that. Like one of the issues that I, I would, I would think what might be challenging, and I don't know what kind of challenge. I mean, I, I assuming I'm assuming this was a challenging project, just given the subject matter. But like, how do you take a story like this and make it entertaining? Like, how do you, how do you translate this story into something that people want to watch? And and how do you make it not, uh, like for lack of a better term, like eat your vegetables programming? There was so much so many things that they had to overcome and so many conflicts along the way that they were dealing with uh, from, from discrimination along the way, from uh, their own personal backgrounds and stories that uh, I think that the film moves along just by, because they're, they're such engaging women that you just want to like go along and it. And uh, the entertainment is, is them and they're having fun at the same time. And is so they were just entertaining in themselves. And my job was just to be as transparent as possible. You kind of feel like you lucked out when you found these people. Oh, totally. 100% lucked out. Uh, I, I always think that a good documentary is all about um, finding, finding good subjects for your film, having good access. And if you find a story along the way, that's even better. But it's, it's really about the subject and the access to them. And this was, how many feature documentaries had you made before this? So this is my second feature. Uh, my first feature was a film called Adopting Haiti. And it was about uh, the orphan evacuations after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Um, I produced that one very similarly where I, I hitchhiked into Haiti about four days after that earthquake um, and found this orphanage that uh, CNN had been broadcasting from uh, and they the CNN was actually pushing the State Department and asking them why they hadn't uh, evacuated these kids because a lot of these kids had uh, parents in the United States that were going to adopt them for an adoption situation. So I followed, uh, followed these kids as they were eventually airlifted out and then found out that most of the parents were still alive. So I uh, went back down and documented just the dynamics of why uh, Haitian parents had to give up their, their children and just what the what the situation is was, was something like that. Uh, what was the name of that picture? Adopting Haiti. And that was how how long ago? That would have been 2010, and we released on uh, we released it in 2011. 
it had a good run. It was uh, on VOD for about six years or so, and then you still can find it on VOD. But uh, yeah, it was a, it, a, it really brought a lot of conversation to the to the issue of foreign adoptions. Uh, so in other words, this was not your first rodeo. You had made a film like this before and been successful. Yeah. Um, what kind of uh, advice would you have for somebody who was, you know, looking to make documentaries and get into this line of work? What would you say to like a young documentarian looking to break through? I, th I think for young documentaries, the biggest thing is to just get started. I think, uh, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about going after grants or whatever uh, it may be that could hold us up. And, and the technology is so cheap now. It's, it's like the typewriter is now accessible to everybody. If you, if you can use that analogy, you can, I mean, the camera uh, that I used for this film was bought at Best Buy. You can just run down to Best Buy, pick up all the equipment you need and just go and tell a story and like find some amazing subjects and just connect with them and, and uh, put everything behind you and just uh, enjoy that time and space. And, and that's what's going to make for a great documentary. For you, it was the, the spontaneity of the project. But, you know, people do write documentaries like this. This was even though you kind of did this spontaneously, I would imagine that there was some writing that took place after the fact in terms of trying to shape this into a story and, you know, going through, you said you whittled it down to 16 hours of footage, you know, like for me, I would rather not shoot something like that. <laughs> like that's just way too much work. You'd rather plan it all out. Yeah. I mean, so, well, I guess it depends on the story too. Like w with what you're doing is a like sort of this news topical happening right this second it's not like you had months to research and pre-production and all that kind of stuff and i imagine it had you gone down there and not gotten any good film and not found these people you just would have went home you know like you you wouldn't have spent weeks down there unless there was a story worth telling yeah i i think that that's that's definitely true i think that um there, you, you know, you're talking about weaving something like this together. There's definitely always going to be, when you do it like this, continuity issues. Um, and those are always po posing a problem of like, how do you set up a film like this? Because you halfway along the, the journey, you might meet new characters that come into, into the, your main character's lives and stuff. And so um, shaping and working with that is always, is always going to be a challenge. But um, but I think that that just adds to the authenticity of it and the realism of it. And so I'm kind of okay with that. And, and sometimes if things don't quite make sense, as long as we're co constantly coming back to the same themes and stuff, I think that uh, it all works out in the end because uh, their journey is, is one worth documenting and, and it's, uh, it's as true and pure to the, what really happened as I think it, it, is possible really oh, that's great i think that might be a great note to leave off on uh it's definitely an exciting documentary i hope people got to see it at brooklyn uh you guys do have a vod deal, uh, deal but are you playing any other film festivals are you planning a theatrical run anywhere um we're not planning a theatrical run or uh any, any other festivals planned as of right now um due to covid a lot of them have been canceled and postponed so Right now, we're really pushing for our VOD. And uh, for people who want to know more about you and about the movie, where can they find you on the web? The easiest way to find the film is go to the Right Girls website, which is therightgirlsfilm.com. Uh, and then if you want to learn more about me, you can check out uh, my website, Wolfer Productions, or find me on Instagram at Tim Wolfer. I'd also really quick just like to thank the team. Like I, like I mentioned, I have a huge post-production and marketing team that really came together to put this together. So couldn't have done it without them. And of course, the women who uh, were gracious enough to trust, trust me with their stories. I remember Bill saying that he thinks that one or two of them could probably be reality show stars <laughs> in, in the future. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he thought they were like great personalities, but uh, I do think it's an interesting film. I think it's a great story that you told. Uh, and, uh, you know, I uh, hope people will find it and, and, and see it. And it puts a face on, on people that really didn't get one before, uh, which, which is an admirable quality uh, in, a, in, a, in a documentary. Uh, but thanks so much, Tim. I, I appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, let us know uh, if you have anything to follow up. Keep us posted. Uh, and when you have your next project, uh, you're welcome to come back.
Awesome. I really appreciate it. And thank you for, for putting this show on and, and doing it in the midst of pandemic. This is really awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all we got for you today. Thanks so much for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more of our content, including our movie reviews, visit our website, norestfortheweekendpodcast.com. Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, JMR Rentals. For more on them, visit their website, jmrny.com. And once again, I'd like to thank my guest, Timothy Wolfer. For Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.